Hey everybody, it's Ed. Before we start, I've got two quick announcements. The first one is I want to thank our newest podcast supporter, Vaughn Johnson. Vaughn signed up to support the podcast through Patreon, which is monthly support. If you want to learn more how all that works, both monthly and other options, go to mountainandpray.com slash support. Second thing is I want to tell you about a very special offer from the Free Flow Institute that's exclusive for Mountain and Prairie listeners. The Free Flow Institute, you've probably heard me talk about it before, but it's a Montana-based organization that builds opportunities for creativity, space, and access to wild places for writers, artists, and leaders of all backgrounds. Free Flow eliminates the barrier between you, your ideas, and your environment by bringing emerging and established writers, leaders, artists, and communicators together into wild landscapes. The lineup of Free Flow instructors includes many past guests of Mountain Prairie, including Heather Hansman, Alexis Bonagovsky, Hal Herring, Brendan Leonard, and Chris Latre. I'd encourage you to go to FreeFlow's website at freeflowinstitute.com to learn all about the program. And next month, in September of 2021, you can join Pulitzer Prize finalist Bill DeBuise, who was also a guest on this podcast a few years ago, on a five-day creative writing workshop on the Green River's Gates of Lador, where you'll spend days floating between canyon walls, analyzing the concept of change in literature, climate, life, and writing. There are only a very few spots left on this particular trip as of August 18th, 2021. And so I'd encourage you to sign up. And as a special offer for Mountain and Prairie listeners, if you mention Mountain and Prairie or me, when you sign up, you'll get $100 off the tuition. So go to freeflowinstitute.com to learn more or reach out to me and I'm glad to answer any questions. Thanks a lot. Hey, this is Ed Robertson, and this is the Mountain and Prairie Podcast, where I introduce you to some of the innovative individuals who are shaping the future of the American West. I meet most of these people through my work in land conservation, or through my hobbies and interests that revolve around spending time up high in the mountains. My guests include ranchers, writers, entrepreneurs, conservationists, athletes, artists, adventurers, pretty much anyone who's doing important work, has an interesting story, and loves the American West. My guest today is Antonia Malchik. Antonia is a Montana-based writer and essayist, and she's also the author of the book, A Walking Life, Reclaiming Our Health and Freedom One Step at a Time. She's written for publications including The Atlantic and High Country News, and she also writes a regular Substack newsletter titled On the Commons, which I highly recommend. Antonia thinks deeply about a wide range of topics, including community, conservation, the environment, private property, the West, books, and much more. She has a true talent for writing about complex subjects in an engaging, in-depth manner that both educates and challenges the reader. Antonia grew up in northwest Montana. Her mother was a multi-generational Montanan, and her father was a first-generation immigrant from the former Soviet Union. Her family heritage, combined with her innate curiosity, gave Antonia a unique perspective on the world that informs all of her work. She's lived in Moscow, Vienna, Australia, and other far-flung regions— but she's always been drawn back to the landscape of her home state of Montana, where she currently lives with her husband and two children. I've been a longtime fan of Antonia's work, so it was a real pleasure to have her finally join me on the podcast. Just as her work covers a broad range of topics, so does this conversation. We talk about everything from Russian history to her Montana ancestors to her longstanding commitment to the craft of writing. We talk about why she has chosen not to participate in social media and how she manages to consume online news and media without being overwhelmed or overly distracted. We talk a lot about her writing process, her thoughts on publishing her work, and her approach to exploring and writing about potentially controversial ideas. We talk a lot about her book, A Walking Life, as well as how the act of walking can contribute to strong communities, mental health, and physical well-being. And finally, Antonia is known for her excellent book recommendations, and she offers up some great ones in this episode. Be sure to check out the episode notes for links to all the books and authors that she mentions. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and can't thank Antonia enough for all of her hard work. Hope you enjoyed as well. There's a quote on your website that I thought would be a good launching point. And it's just like suspenseful enough and leaves enough open-ended questions that I need more. So it says, when I was 14, 
My parents removed me from Montana, dropped me on the streets of Soviet Moscow, and said, quote, don't get lost. So what is that all about? (laughs) So my father is from the Soviet Union. Um, He grew up under Stalin and emigrated to the U.S. in 1974, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, my mom's um, born and raised Montanan, grew up on a on a homestead, basically, in eastern Montana. Um, and so I grew up in Montana. I was born and raised here. And it's, <laughs> it's interesting you started with that quote, because it's kind of a long story that I've never um, really told before. So I'm just trying to think how to shorten it in real time. Now, this is a podcast, so- <laughs> and it's my podcast. And so we can do whatever we want. Make it as long as you want. I don't want to ramble at people. Um, So let me think. In 1991, Mm -hmm. uh, some dude in San Francisco with money hired my parents to come do consulting work with him in um, San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And so we were living in Montana. My dad's an electrical engineer. But, you know, he's Russian. My mom is fluent. She worked a long time as an interpreter and a translator. And um, I, I should ask them. I don't actually know how this how this even came about, actually. But the Soviet Union was starting to open up. The wall hadn't fallen yet. But Gorbachev was was allowing more uh, free market activity. Yep. And I think this guy wanted to open a telecommunications business in Moscow. And so he hired my parents. We moved down to San Francisco. Well, we moved to Burlingame, so the Bay Area, for six months. So I went to my freshman year of high school, six months in Burlingame, and uh, in March of, it was in 91, actually, in March of 91, we moved to Moscow Oh wow! Okay. in Russia. And you couldn't go to the Soviet Union in the 1980s um, yeah. when I was growing up, so I never met my family over there. My, dad, my dad's um, parents were still alive. He has a brother and sister over there. I've got one cousin in my whole family, wow. and she was over there. Um, and so I had never met any of them. Uh, my older sister had because she'd, she'd lived in Leningrad until she was two. By the time we moved to Moscow, my f- grandfather had died, but my other relatives were still alive. And so it was this whole huge thing where not only were my parents moving to help people start a business, but... My younger sister and I were going to meet our family for the first time. Yeah. Um, we stopped going to school and just took immersive Russian lessons three hours every day. And um, I did not have a helicopter parent childhood. It was, like, I guess you'd call it free range now, sure. an extreme version. Um, so when we moved to Russia, well, then it was still the Soviet Union very briefly. This is just before the Soviet Union fell. I mean, my parents just let us go. We just did our own thing. We went to our lessons in the morning from nine to noon. And then we got to Rome, Moscow. And my sister was nine Mm -hmm. and I was 14 and then 15. And it was, uh, it was quite adventure, probably defined a lot of the rest of my life. Um, like how do you looking back now, you know, with, with hindsight, how would you like, what are some of the biggest ways that that kind of changed the trajectory of things? I mean, that's obviously, I can't even, I mean, if you had just moved to New York city or something that would have been quite a change I would imagine. And, but, but to a completely different culture who in some ways were were our enemies during that specific time period, that's, that's pretty wild. So like when you look back, how did that change things for you? Oh, there's a lot in that one. Um, yeah, I, I mean, that was the cold war. So growing up in Montana, like I wasn't really aware like, I just didn't realize that my dad would be considered an enemy. And this is despite the fact, by the way, that the FBI used to come visit us. Would they really? Like, yeah. I, I mean, he was from Russia. So they he was from Russia. Like, eye on, oh, on him. I didn't yeah. even think about that aspect uh, of it. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, we've got a picture of uh, the house I, uh, house I grew up in, I think. And my mom, like, served him tea because she's super charming. She really mm-hmm. knows how to win people over. Yeah. And there was another situation where the guy came to our house while my dad was at work and was going at my mom. Like, how could you have married this this traitor to our country? Really? Dinner? Not traitor, maybe. But, yeah. Um, or spy, I think. And uh, and she just, like, sat him down and talked about Russian poetry and because that was her. She was doing a Ph.D. in Russian poetry when my parents met. So that was her thing. So I didn't. I, I grew up probably with a, a very confused understanding of um, <clears throat> international relations as far as the Soviet Union went. And things like my dad didn't learn English until he was 30, so his accent is really strong. And 
obviously growing up in small town Montana, that prompted a lot of comments. Like even my name alone is is not super common. It's easy to identify as foreign. So I don't know. I think it was different for me going over there than it would have been for other people because Russia really, like Russian culture, saturated my childhood. My mm-hmm. mother is a Russophile and a Slavophile. She just loves Russian poetry, Russian literature, art, everything. And and so it was a big part of my life. So moving there, it weirdly didn't feel necessarily foreign. Mm-hmm. I, there were specific things about it, like you couldn't you couldn't just go to a grocery store and get food. I mean, there were stores, but they might have sausage or bread. You could just get uh, black bread or white bread. That was that was it. And Fanta, for some reason, uh, Fanta was really big. I drank the soft Fanta. drink. Yeah, the yeah. orange. Yeah, I remember that stuff. Pop. Yeah, I didn't. Never, I thought that was a a purely American uh, thing. No, that's that's interesting. I, I think something that seeped in. I think it was owned by Coca Cola, and they made, they made some deal with the government or something. Um, so moving there, I feel like at the time it was really it was definitive for me just just being able to roam around a city by myself or usually with my younger sister. And uh, we made friends with the next door neighbors and went places with them. Um, and, and I think it gave me a bit of a travel bug. Sure. Um, and I don't know if I would have had that anyway, but it, it definitely planted that seed in me. I wanted, once I was in college and then graduating college, I really wanted to wander the world and just mm-hmm. go places and walk cities. That was I mean, I, I had a lot of intentions and goals and dreams, but probably behind everything was I just wanted to go to places I had never seen before and walk around in cities and watch people and read books about the place. And so how long – I know you've you've lived internationally. I mean, you've, you've been to a lot of places. So what, what was – how long were you there before either leaving there or coming back to the United States, whatever the next step was? We were only there – I want to say four months. Okay. So when I say like moving to the Soviet Union, you know, it's this tiny, tiny um, space of time. Sure. But uh, for me, it, it was a very formative period. I think like 14, 15. Sure. You can be influenced by a lot of different things very easily because you're still forming your sense of self. Mm-hmm. Um, so we left two weeks before the coup that brought down the Soviet Union. And I don't, I don't think anyone really knew. Well, we certainly didn't have a hint that it was coming, but that's when we moved back to the U S Okay. and just back to Montana and to my little small town, Montana life. And <laughs> so that's, that's very, so that the, the coup was fall of 91. Is that correct? I think it was August, August. I, I remember, remember I was at, I, this is a very bizarre memory as a kid. I don't know why I remember it, but I was at, um, I was playing soccer. I had a soccer game that day. And, uh, I remember when it was over, my parents were telling me that this was happening and, uh, that, that, that the Soviet union was, um, falling, I guess, for, for lack of a better word. And I don't know why I had, you know, I, we all knew who Gorbachev was and, you know, Reagan right. and all that stuff. But I just remember, I, I have that memory. And so I always think of it as I remember it was 91 and I remember I was playing soccer. So, um, that's amazing. Yeah. Isn't that weird? Um, I, I don't, I'm not even sure what my parents told me. All I remember is that um, the, our neighbors that we were friends with, the guy was a little bit older than I was, and he was in the army. Um, super cute guy, <laughs> and he he was manning the the communications on the barricades. Wow! He hadn't given us any hint. I'm sure he must have known something. What's a but, um? You, know, you always hear about people who are obsessed with Russian literature, Russian history, Russian poetry, and I literally know nothing about any of it. If there's one book that somebody like me can understand, I'm not talking about PhD stuff. I'm just talking about a normal person. What's a what's a good book about Russian history that a normal person or let's say a little less smart than a normal person could understand? <laughs> a little less smart than a normal person. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, there is one that was published by an American journalist in the 70s, and I am blanking the name. I think his name was Heinrich. 
I would have to look it up and send it to you. Okay, I'll put it in the notes after the fact. It's it's really good. He really understood the the culture. I I felt like, and both my parents felt like that. They communicated with him a bit when it was when it was published. There's a history book called Natasha's Dance that I read maybe 15 years ago, mm-hmm. and that is that's a wonderful comprehensive overview of Russian history. I don't know. I don't know if it's such a good perspective on culture. But it might be a good one on how culture developed out of the kinds of societal and political structures that were there at the time. Like in, in Russia, the Mongol invasions are mm-hmm. still really resonant today. And you're talking over like a thousand years ago. Wow. And that still defines a lot of the way that Russia and Russians feel about the world. There's there's just this constant fear of being encroached on, being invaded, Mm -hmm. and that can manifest in really unfortunate ways. Um, uh, Makes it authoritarianism attractive, I think. Sure. But for something closer, there's, there are two books about the siege of Leningrad that I really like. Uh, One of them, a lot of people might've heard of called the 900 days. And that one's more military focused. I think that was published in maybe the 60s. And the reason I love this is because my my grandparents survived the siege of Leningrad. So Mm -hmm. my grandfather stayed in the city. My grandmother evacuated with her two older kids to the Urals. He almost starved to death. Thousands and thousands of people starved. It was an incredible time. But then there's another one by a British scholar named Anna Reed called Leningrad. And it's about the same time period, but I think she published it in around... 1992, or at least started researching at 92. So she had access to a lot more resources okay. than the other guy did. And uh, it's just fascinating, just people's accounts of what they went through. And there's one other book uh, called, it's by a Ukrainian author, Svetlana Alexeyevich, who won the Nobel Prize some years ago. It's called The Unwomanly Face of War. And mm-hmm. I, it's, I often say it's one of the most important books I've ever read. And one of the reasons is because when we read about war in history, we always read about, it's kind of the great man theory. Like it's always the generals doing this and strategy about that. And here's how the armies moved. And this is just accounts of normal women and why and how they decided to go fight in World War II. Nice. A lot of them became snipers. Really? (laughs) Snipers. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> it's really interesting. And then in between it, she's got, I think she originally wrote it in the 1980s. So in between these accounts, she also has her own struggles getting information from the Soviet government, which at the at the time was still pretty tight. Man, I didn't know. No, that's awesome. And that's what people listening it's to this. A great book. Let's see. We're, my timer says 14 minutes, and this is just the beginning of the book recommendation, so you better get ready because there's the, the episode <laughs> notes are going to be very extensive. Um, You've got to go next, right? No, I, I, guess, I guess you already do your job with your book recommendation. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, <laughs> all right, so that's, that's one side of the family. The other side of the family, longtime Montana folks, and I, I wanted to – there's a great um, post on your sub stack on the commons, which I'll link to, and I think everybody should subscribe, and I put it in my email list. It's really, really uh, insightful and fun and educational. But there was a post you put on there recently where you were talking about how some people would have called your ancestors pioneers, and you had some thoughts about that term and just the mindset of, of pioneers. And so maybe could you talk a little bit about your, your family, the Montana side of your family and just kind of how they ended up where they, where they are. Yeah, that is actually an area that I am, I'm still developing. So anything I say uh, at this point is it's, I, I know that I'm still developing my own knowledge yeah, 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 because my family, with the exception of my mother, was not great at uh, telling stories mm-hmm. or histories. It just it just wasn't that important to their lives. And my mother is an only child, and I think she has one cousin. My family just doesn't have a lot of kids yeah, anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> um, and her father was, let me see, there were two boys and four girls, so... There's just a lot that I don't know. Mm -hmm. And after I posted that, I think, was that the one where I linked to the Montana Land Reliance Anthology? That's exactly right. So I have an essay in there. And 
it's really just about feeling the loss of my hometown, which I which I think a lot of people can identify with these days in the West because you get so many people moving in and it's this feeling like what happened to my home, <clears throat> which I think it's important to temper with remembering that when people like my ancestors came, they took other people's homes who had been here for much longer. So yes. <clears throat> I try to keep that in mind. So my mother sent me an email after I'd written that because I had this line about how, for those of the pioneer spirit, there's nowhere left to go. And that's part of where my community mindedness comes from. Just this understanding that y- you can't keep running. There's no, there's no planet big enough that can accommodate everyone's desire to just be left alone mm-hmm. and live their lives. We have to live together somehow as much as I, I would let, just love to live in a cabin in the woods and not pay attention to anything yeah. <laughs> at yeah. all, except for, you know, writing and nature and hunting and, and all the stuff I love to do. So my mother emailed me and she said, she <laughs> it was a super long description of how our, they weren't pioneers. They were homesteaders and there's a difference. And so I'm trying to understand what exactly that difference is because they came from, what was then Prussia in um, northern, what's now Germany. Mm -hmm. It was Denmark ruled Prussia, which is confusing on its own. So they, long story short, they ended up in eastern Montana, made a claim, staked a claim on a homestead and managed to make a success of it, which for homesteaders, that percentage is not super high. So they were really hardworking people. They were very smart they really put their backs into it. I, I have a, a picture of them actually above my desk mm-hmm. right here, which I, and I have my Russian grandparents on the other side. So nice. Try to keep my ancestors inspiring me. I do um, the same thing. Or, or at least, oh, good. I do, yeah. <laughs> Not inspiring, but more like get it together. Yeah, that's what I have. I keep, like, in, keep me in line. <laughs> Like, like you better, yes. look, yeah, that's, like, I do the same thing. Through, you would better not waste your time. Exactly. So, and, and they have very, stern faces and they're all like tall and good looking. So (laughs) (laughs) it's a lot looking down on you. So they homesteaded and my, let me see, it's my grandfather's cousin's son still runs that original homestead. Oh, wow. It's got the original barn. It's the original property. They did expand over time. So it's a, it's a working wheat and cattle ranch and we go visit sometimes. Mm Mm-hmm. So, yeah, my mom grew up not on that homestead, but on one nearby that her grandfather had, had started, or I think his parents had started it. So that's that's a short homesteader history. Sure. Um, although what's weird about my childhood is is I didn't really know much of it growing up. My mother was more interested in the Russia side and Russian culture. Mm-hmm. And so I maybe visited the ranch that she grew up on twice, I think. Mm-hmm. And I... I seen it more often since my grandfather sold it because the <clears throat> the couple that bought it and their son are really wonderful people. And oh, that's good. Super welcoming and involved. So how much, you know, as you're figuring out both the facts of your, your family history and then your thoughts around family history, you know, like the, the whole thing about homesteading and, and taking land from Native Americans, you know, I mean, where anybody of European descent has to wrestle with that. So, and it's there's no right answer. I mean, there's no easy answer to figure it out and square it up in your head against your your own experience and your family's experience. It's like how that's one and one of the things I love about your your blog or your Substack is that I feel like a lot of it is you writing to to better understand things and to yeah. kind of dig deep. I mean, that's that's the way I read it. I could be wrong, but it, I, I love I love reading it. And so, how much? of your writing is going through the process of trying to better understand things, whether it's your family or or anything. I mean, is that, is that a big reason you write? It's probably most of it. Really? Yeah. Well, especially with the Substack because it's, there's no, there's no editor, there's no assignment. There's just me with an idea and what do I do with this? And I think part of that reason is because I'm not an academic. I don't work in academia. I never have. Uh, I I never really wanted to. I mm-hmm. did at one point want to do a PhD in logic, but there aren't many places in the world where you can do that. So yeah. <laughs> kind of let that one go. But I, I I did an MFA in creative writing at Emerson College in Boston, and I just early on saw so many people who were going down the adjunct route, which is you've got this MFA program. They give you an opportunity to teach undergrad writing classes, and they call it an opportunity. 
but but really it's for the college to just get really cheap labor. Yeah. And and then people graduating from an MFA program and you've got debt and you want to write and the obvious thing seems to be to teach college. So that's it's really it's common and and I just didn't I didn't want that. It doesn't pay well and mm-hmm. when I workshop someone's essay, for example, I put a ton of time and thought and work into it. And I knew that I wouldn't be able to do my own writing if I yeah. <clears throat> had a class of students at the same time. Actually, one of my mentors said that to me once and it felt really validating. Uh, Pico Iyer, he's he's just such a wonderful, generous person. Mm-hmm. Person, And when you do a workshop with him, he'll put a lot into it. But he says that's why he doesn't teach because yeah. he knows that it would take all of him and then he wouldn't write books and he writes wonderful books. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think that not being an academic just allows me the space to play around with these ideas. Mm-hmm. I can read these scholarly books and not have to produce a paper. It doesn't have to pertain to my little niche area of whatever it is I'm studying because I'm interested in everything. Mm-hmm. So I, I can just read it and and take it on and think about what that means for my life, what I value for community, for the world, how we as humans all try to live together. I, mm-hmm. I can just, and if I feel like a book isn't doing that, I, I might not finish it anyway. Sure. So the books I talk about are <clears throat> usually the ones that that serve that purpose in some way. And it's mm-hmm. a micro purpose of me trying to understand things and a macro purpose of how does this help us as a species mm-hmm. live better uh, I also started it because I was intending to write a book about the commons and private property and ownership and just the struggle between private property rights and the health of the commons. So uh, I, to take an obvious example, if you own a chemical factory and you want to produce things that then produces pollution, you have the right to do that because you have the property right to produce Mm -hmm. something you can do what you want with your property but then that pollution goes out and it it trespasses basically into ecosystems and other people and that's something that i'm really interested in is that struggle because it's easy to just be like private property rights are sacred because we're america and that's and that's what we do but it's just not that simple and so it's a topic i'm really interested in i was might still write a book about it but that that proposal didn't didn't go anywhere i think the idea was too big actually no well i i feel like you're a lot of publishers like if you're a famous journalist sure go ahead and do this but well what i like about it is that yeah the publishers i mean they're like we talked about on the phone the other day they're they're all the uh, my past of the nba like we got to make money off of this thing they're not the creative for the most part they're not and so like i i admire that instead of you know just giving up on it you you or putting it out to the world and you're putting it out on this sub stack that I think is, is so interesting. But one of the questions I had about it is like, there was one, I don't think it's not in your, it's not sub stack, but it was an article that you wrote. And I think it was years ago. It might've been five years ago where the headline was about rethinking private property. And when you read the article, it's very nuanced, very thoughtful. I mean, even if somebody could completely disagree with what you're saying, if they're a reasonable person, they would appreciate the the thought experiment of going through this with you, mm-hmm. you know, but I, I noticed there were a bunch of comments, which I looked <laughs> and people, you know, these fools on the internet, they just read a headline and they start firing off comments. And I don't understand, first of all, who has time to do that. I don't think I've ever left a comment on anything. That I do not know. But <laughs> you, but I noticed that you would reply to some of them and with very thoughtful replies. And so the, I guess the first question is, how do you, do you get nervous about putting out content that could make people mad? And it seems like everybody's mad about everything these days. And then how do you go about deciding whether you're going to respond or not? Because I was very impressed and kind of surprised that you would put that much, be so kind as to reply, whereas I would just either delete the comment or ignore it. <laughs> um, that specifically depends on the outlet. Okay. So I've published with the Atlantic and Washington Post, and I I don't even look at the comments on those because they don't they don't monitor them in any way, and mm-hmm. so there's just a lot of junk. Like, Garbage. I remember noticing I think it's the very first piece I had with the Atlantic uh, on the history of the hairbrush, <laughs> um, and and someone 
I glanced at the comments and someone had said something and I realized that I had seen that same comment on like five other Atlantic articles. And I was like, oh, this person just goes and copies and pastes the same comment everywhere. So it, it really, really depends on the outlet. I think the article you're talking about was with Aeon. Yes, it was. Or Aeon, uh, who owns the earth. And they, in order to comment on their essays, you have to register as a subscriber, or at least register. I don't know if you have to subscribe, but I mean, not that it costs anything, but you do have to actually take a step Mm -hmm. in order to be able to comment on their essays. And I usually find, I've done three essays with them, and I almost always find that with very, very rare exceptions, the commenters do want to have some kind of discussion, even if they're trying to tell me what I should be thinking Mm -hmm. or saying. And what's interesting is that when I respond to them, they sometimes will respond back and limits how much you can't go down a rabbit hole. You can't just keep going back and forth, but they will often respond more thoughtfully. I find this on medium too, which is weird. I wouldn't expect that because medium is such a strange sprawling platform Mm -hmm. but when people comment on there if i respond to them all of a sudden their tone changes and Mm -hmm. we're engaged in a dialogue more than a this person just wants to forward their agenda of evolution or or something like that (laughs) sometimes get those so does it make me nervous i i get nervous every time i post anything i have like massive anxiety attack and you know, the cabin in the woods looks awfully attractive. And I'm often like, am I too old to train to be a wildland firefighter yet? <laughs> a lot of my friends are firefighters. And maybe I could just go join them. And that would be. So why do you keep doing it? I, I think it, I'm just called to be a writer. I, I, as a kid, I wrote stories. It's what I always wanted to do. I remember telling my husband really early in our marriage that all I really wanted to do was write books for a living. Mm -hmm. And that is not what I do for a living. I copy edit textbooks for a living, Mm -hmm. which is, which is fun. I I actually enjoy that job, but I, I maybe don't know how to process and interpret the world that I personally move through without doing it on the page. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's so core to who I am. And my mom's a writer, too. She's, I think I told you on her call, she's a singer-songwriter now, so she does a lot of music. She's super creative. And my dad's very logical and good with words, so I'm, I'm sure part of it's genetic. It just comes through. Yeah. But everything about my way of understanding the world is is on paper. Like, mm-hmm. if I'm, I, I'm never tempted to go to a therapist because I would have to talk to somebody and... <laughs> I don't, I don't like talking at people. I don't like when people talk at me. Yeah. And uh, but I, if I sit down with my notebook and process through something, that's that's my way of coping. Even with really really difficult situations that are intractable, even when I don't have answers, that's that's how I I do it. I can't. And so I have these panic attacks doing it, and these anxiety attacks. But I know enough by you know 45 years old. Like I know that I'm not going to stop doing it. I'm not thinking about maybe someday I'll have some huge success or something. I just know that if I am lucky enough to live to a really old age, when I get to the end of it, there is nothing I would regret more than giving up Mm -hmm. doing this. And then, you know, writing's not, you don't have to put it out in the world. I don't have to publish it. I, I write a lot of fiction and it's, I've never since, well, I, I have once sent sense them out. Um, but I'm not good enough yet to. <laughs> to so you that. think, I bet, I bet if you put it out, no, then you never know. No, it's, I read a lot of fiction. I, I know it's not there yet, but for the, for the nonfiction, uh, I had to turn it into, for me, for my satisfaction, it had to be something that served people. Mm-hmm. Even if it's just like five people, does this help you exist in the world in some way, whether it's you're having a hard day, you've suffered a loss, society is insane and climate change is, you know, whether it's any of that or you're just, I don't know, want to want to think about something interesting. It has to serve people. Mm-hmm. And so oftentimes it's just me going, what would I want to read that could help me through this particular situation I'm going through? And, and that's sometimes my entry point into, 
into what I'm doing. No, that makes sense. And I think that's the magic. That's the, the good side of the internet is that whatever, like in my case with this podcast, I've got this very diverse set of interests with, you know, that overlap in this one point, which is this podcast. And I just thought I was the only weirdo out there that had that, that, that had these, all these interests. And what do you know? There's all these people all over the world that, that share right? my interest. And so, but I, I think I, I try to approach the podcast. I'm not trying to put myself in your league at all, but like I try to approach this podcast with the same, almost like a spirit of generosity. Like, and I, I think about it from the perspective of my 25 year old self when I was wearing a suit at Merrill Lynch and I wanted to be in Jackson Hole and, <laughs> <laughs> and I was scared to do it. And so, like, if I if I could have listened to somebody like you, maybe that would have helped me speed up the process a little bit. So. I think that's Vice versa. I mean, some of the, a lot of the interviews you do really, really help me. I mean, I look, I, I can confess, like when we talked on the phone previously and you said something about not asking for permission, which is, it's a common phrase, right? We've heard that mm-hmm. for what, 10, 20 years yeah. now. Don't ask for permission. Just go ahead and do it. And <laughs> we got off the phone and I said, Oh my gosh, I'm still sitting around waiting for someone to give me permission, Mm -hmm. like waiting for someone to be like, Hey, you want to turn this into a column or something? And, and I don't even want that. You know, I just want to do my thing. And yet somewhere in my head, I was still thinking that way. And I think I love your podcast for that reason, because it's just this constant reminder of, you know, no matter how many hoops you go through, it's, it's not going to cut it. There's no end. There's no final point. I think, uh, Stephen Colbert, he was on, he was on Oprah's show, I think a couple of years ago on her, on her uh, podcast. Now mm-hmm. she has, and she asked him something about being the number one, the number one show and, and what that feels like. And of course, being Stephen Colbert, he just joked around, but then he got serious for a second and he said, well, it, it, it lets you do more of the work. Mm-hmm. And, and that really hit home for me. Cause that's all I want. I just, I, I mean, I want to raise my kids. I want to, figure out freaking napweed <laughs> yeah. really badly. Yeah. Um, I, I want a lot of things, but fundamentally, as far as my work goes, I just want to be able to keep doing it. No, I, I think, and I think that's a common theme on this podcast and people I've talked to. And I think a, a great example of that is Brendan Leonard. He's uh, mm-hmm. got the blog semi rad. And that's, that's exactly what he says is he's like, I want to do art. I want to create art so that then I can create more art. And, mm-hmm. and I, I was, had coffee with him a while back and I was said something like, can you believe that you have your own column in outside magazine? Like, can you believe that? And he was like, <laughs> he kind of shrugged his shoulders. He's like, I mean, you're just grinding, man. Like, and it doesn't, you know, in the end it's like, yeah, it's cool, but that's kind of how it's worked out. And now I'm thinking about the next thing and thinking about another project. And I, I think, mm-hmm. you know, he, in, in his little, you know, corner of the internet he is about as successful as one can be and yet he's yeah. he's not like basking in it or anything he's a he's thinking you know right. i just gotta i gotta get this next blog post out and i think that keeps everybody humble and i think the thing you said about waiting for permission i think there's this it's like a um disconnect if you're a conscientious person and you're you observe you can if you're empathetic or compassionate to other people like you you are kind of taking cues from other people. And in my old life of selling real estate to really, really rich people, a lot of these CEOs and billionaire types, it's like they're missing the part of their brain where they care what anybody else thinks at any level. And they're just going to do what they want to do. And there's a lot of bad that comes with that. But in some ways it's a superpower if it can be used for something halfway good, because they literally just do not care what anybody else thinks. And that can go sideways and get real bad real quick as we've seen but i don't know it's almost like when you're like me and you you have to figure out a way to turn that <laughs> that thing yeah. off a little bit and just go you yeah know? well um, i mean maybe that's having your your ancestors hanging by your by your desk to remind you you know don't be an egotistical asshole you don't mm-hmm. you don't get to do that after we worked our fingers to the bone and Suffered all these hardships. I, it's interesting. I have a friend here in Whitefish. Uh, we went to high school together, and she she's kind of amazing. She was raised by a single dad in the eighties in Montana. Super uncommon, I think. And she went off to become a work for a hedge fund. 
Oh, wow. And she became super, super successful. And then she plowed that money and energy and creativity into starting a fashion line, which she just started this last year. And she's one of those anchors. She kind of pulls me, I, not so much an anchor, but a tether and mm-hmm. just like, don't give up your power. Don't you know, a lot of kind of pro feminist stuff, but mm-hmm. she's, she's just really good at it. And she, uh, that's right. You said we can swear on this podcast. Yeah. She let it, let it rip. No fucks yeah, at all like, good. about anything or what anyone says. She's going to do her thing. And yet at the same time, she adores her dad and stepmom and she remains loyal to her friends. And it's, it's kind of a good example of, of how you can just keep doing that. Not that I, I don't want to start a fashion line or hang out with a lot of the, the people that she gets to hobnob with, but just that perspective of stiffen your spine, step mm-hmm. forward keep going. Cause like I said to you over the phone in a hundred years, not only will I be dead, no one will remember I existed. So I might as well do the best I can. Yeah. You just time. go, just Got go. It. I think it's, yeah. I think that's, and I think when you, when you are personal friends or you, you get to know somebody well, who is, has that attitude and then you can see like, well, they're just a normal person. They're not, there's, yeah. they don't have any secret. See, I mean, their, their demeanor may be a little different, but in the end, it's just, they're just a normal person. Well, an ability to wear really high heels. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't know much about that, but <laughs> I'm impressed that anybody can do it. And, uh, when I worked in offices, but that's, that's definitely a talent I didn't keep for long. But I wear really yeah, high running shoes, like Hoka's and Ultra's with all the cushion. It makes me about six foot to, five. Oh, wow. That yeah. sounds yeah. It's kind of scary. It yeah. Sounds like something I would break my ankle in. <laughs> I, could, I trip a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the other thing is then, you know, if you're a parent trying to help your kids teach that, like for a couple of years, my son was talking about the YouTubers he was watching and, and can I make YouTube? Can I start an account and make some YouTube videos? And I came up with all these good, well-explained reasons for why that's not a good idea. And Mm -hmm. finally, recently, he sent me a video that one of his favorite YouTubers made, some guy who just plays Super Mario Brothers online. I don't understand this world at all, but he's really popular and all he does is play Mario. And he was just, it was this little 17 minute video or something where he was talking about how he had done a slightly different video and the YouTube algorithm had basically punished him for it because Mm -hmm. it wasn't his usual stuff. And then it turned into this cyclical thing where he had a harder time getting his usual stuff to get attention. And he just talked about how it's so exhausting having to produce content all the time and keep up with the algorithm. And that was really useful for me as a parent because it was directly from someone my kid admires saying, this is, this is a grind. This, Mm -hmm. like I look successful. I've got millions of followers, but this sucks Yeah, actually. And, and I'm not having fun pretty much anymore. So I think as the, as the internet era continues to progress and our digital technology goes forward, those kinds of lessons for our kids become entangled very much in all that addictive technology and, you know, interface design and stuff that's really complicated yeah. and new. I it mean, is. I grew up without a TV or a phone, so <laughs> Well, that was another question I had that that adds to another question I had written down here. You're not on social media. You completely cut that out, Mm -hmm. which I think is very, very, very admirable. But you you still consume a lot of info. Like on your sub stack, you always have have a list of good podcasts, good articles. And it's very it reminds me a lot of like on my Patreon uh, newsletter. It's kind of this laundry list of all this crazy stuff that I'm consuming. And when I write it once a month, I'm like damn, man, I need to calm down here. There's too much, too much going <laughs> into my brain. And I have this, so I have at least Instagram going into my brain. And so how do you manage that? Like, it seems like we're wired similarly that we're extremely curious. We want info, but that can easily turn into chaos or, or, or anxiety oh, yeah. or like it's when I go on long runs on the weekend, I'm training for a race now. So I, I be out running for hours and I purposely don't listen to anything because I need my brain to unwind. And so how do you manage consuming enough to give you fuel for what you're writing and give you new ideas and new, new um, insights on things without letting it cross into just a flood Niagara falls of information in your brain. (laughs) That's what I feel like I'm in all day. I I think neither of us are alone in that feeling. That's what, that's what you hear from people all the time. Just this 
constant deluge all mm-hmm. the time. I I grew up in a family that's always been very politically engaged. So politics are a weak point for me. And mm-hmm. it's one of the main reasons I completely deleted my Twitter account was because I, I just, there's, there are a lot of interesting people on Twitter. There's a lot of interesting stuff that goes on in great conversations. And I can look at them and appreciate them. And in a hot second, I will be over on politics, Twitter, getting all wound up mm-hmm. about a variety of different things. And it's just, it's not good for me. And it also doesn't help the world. So, th- so that's how I justify it because it's, like, it's not good for me. Who cares? But if it's not going to help me serve the world, then I, I've got to find ways to cut it out. And so news and politics are, are really something that I can get addicted to within seconds. It mm-hmm. doesn't matter how long it's been since I've looked at them. So I try really hard uh, to not consume daily news, except for my local paper. Yep. I don't read the New York Times. I did read the Washington Post for a couple of years, but I stopped when I realized that I was only reading the opinion columns. Mm-hmm. I'm just looking for ways to to react and and be angry and emotional and get all like, yeah, these people are yeah. whatever. Yeah. I don't know, and that's that's not useful. It, and so I stopped reading that. I I read the Guardian probably longest, and I still go there sometimes. And that was because they were the only major outlet that was taking climate change seriously mm-hmm. for quite a long time. They had a climate desk long before anyone else did, and so I wanted to keep up on that news. So I just I don't. I don't read national or international news as much as possible. My one exception is I do subscribe to the LA Times, which I don't read that often, but it's just, it's more relevant to my life than, yeah. you know, in the West being a, a Westerner, it just has stuff that that's meaningful to me more than the New York Times does. And I don't even read it that, that regularly, even though I pay for a subscription. Um, and Well, I read High Country News, Mm -hmm. obviously, because they're awesome and amazing, and I'm really grateful for what they do. Um, But other than that, yeah. Oh, the other exception is I have a a separate account for um, online shopping, Mm -hmm. just a totally different email account. I I have a Gmail, but then I have a Hotmail for online shopping stuff. And for some reason, after I was in Canada at a writing residency, (laughs) I came home, and my phone even like two phones on has decided that I am in Canada when I log out of Hotmail. Oh, really? So, so it sends me to MSN and I get the Canada news and that's actually useful to me. Mm-hmm. It's not news that I get regularly. And I, I have kept up on COVID news in Canada, wildfires, um, all sorts of first nations, um, issues over water rights and oil pipelines and things. And it's, it, that's actually kind of valuable because it's just not, not stuff I would normally see and not stuff sure. anyone else sees. So I can't go talk with them about it. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody cares. I think that outsider's perspective, which you've obviously, I mean, you've had your whole life because of your, your, your father and then going, you know, traveling yeah. and, and living abroad. And I mean, I think just having an outsider's perspective, I did, I, my wife and I lived in, um, Costa Rica for a year, uh, when I was right after when I, I guess I was 31 and I'd never really traveled internationally. I've been on a climbing trip in South America, but it's the mountains. Like it didn't, it could have been anywhere. And so yeah. I think having. Don't and, say that to South America. Yeah. <laughs> no. Well, it was, it was a big mountain that, that couldn't have been anywhere, but it, it was, uh, you know, it was, I was hanging around a bunch of Americans the whole time. And so I think having, um, being able to look into the U.S. from the outside is so, so valuable. And being able to spend time with people, you know, see it through the perspective of people that are not Americans. Um, that was one of the most formative, formative kind of perspective shifts I've had in my life, I think. I want to talk yeah, about. Yeah, my I husband's want, from England, too. So. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. have that just <laughs> comes at us from all directions. Um, I want to talk briefly about your book, A Walking Life, because it's awesome. And I've had it on my shelf for probably a few years now. And I finally read it. And. It's unbelievably great. And and I was telling you that it's, uh, I think I, but because I procrastinated on reading it, but I think it popped into my life at the, at the exact moment that I needed it. Cause my wife and I have been having a lot of discussions about the importance of community and the important, like the, the neighborhood where we live and the town where we live and just kind of pros and cons of, of everything. And your book 
it reminded me of like a um like a Bill Bryson book where you taught there's this <laughs> common theme that goes through but you you hit a million different subjects along the way like you you hit you know your it's European history or um you know there's all these different angles that that you that you go on but then you keep coming back to the theme of walking and so can you talk a little bit about how did you decide of, of everything you could have written about? Why a book about walking? Well, that's a good question. I, I So for Anne, I had written an a essay called The End of Walking. Mm-hmm. And it was about the loss of walking and walkability in America specifically. And it went, I, I don't want to say it went viral. It just, it was really popular among people who are interested in that subject and and also for people who are going to read a 3,000, 4,000 word essay, which and uh, most of them are really long form stuff. So people have to be dedicated to sure. read something all the way to the end. And I had previously written an essay called Wander, comma, Lost for this little literary journal called Lunch Ticket. And it was more specifically about my life. We were living in upstate New York at the time, well, barely upstate New York. It's it, If there's anyone listening who knows New York. It's Orange County, south of Newburgh. It's on a train line to New York City, but it's okay. super rural. Yeah. So it's kind of hard to describe because to upstate people, it's not really upstate, but I, I'm not from there. I don't know better. <laughs> um, and that was more about just, you know, I had my kids there and we lived in this exurban house. So it's not suburbia, but it's not truly rural. It's these, you know, these kind of vinyl cookie cutter houses on four or five acres each and just disconnected from everything mm-hmm. except for the power grid and the road network. And as my kids, probably as my first kid was growing a little bit and then I was pregnant with the second, there were a few situations like this weird, crazy snowstorm with a lot of freezing rain that just trapped everybody for a while that made me realize just how dependent we were on having a car and being able to, to drive it places. Like mm-hmm. our driveway was 500 feet long. I could wow. not, I, oh, our snowblower broke. That's what happened. <laughs> it's just stuck, but all the plows broke too. And it was, it was weird. And so I, that was a more personal one, just about starting to look around where I lived and realizing that I didn't have the freedom to walk anywhere. And my kids were going to grow up without understanding that they could get places on their feet, Mm -hmm. like without a car. And, and then just realizing how many people in America live that way. It's, it's huge. So that those two things got me interested in the subject. But after the Eon one, I was kind of decided I'd said everything I wanted to say about walking. That was enough. But then I, I kept coming across articles about different things. And I was like, that's interesting. That's interesting. And then um, my agent, my, who, the person who is my agent, reached out to me after my uh, hairbrush, the history of the hairbrush piece in the Atlantic had, had come and asked if I had thought about writing a book about walking. It's like, well, I decided not to, but I've been working on this query letter and I kind of, I kind of wanted to structure it like Michael Pollan's Botany of Desire. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this, I, I really, I love the structure of that book. And you're right. I do have a lot of different angles. And I write pretty much everything that way. Even, even the short stuff, if I cut out a lot of the angles, it's in my head. And so structure is super important to me because if I, if I don't get my, the structure, like the the shape of whether it's an essay or the book, right, Mm -hmm. then it's all just going to fall apart because I have to be able to bring those connective threads together Oh yeah, because otherwise it's just, it's like a, like a supernova it's just all over the place and it doesn't cohere so uh i worked with her on a proposal and and then it kind of went from there and i'll tell you it's um (laughs) the structure i I hadn't even thought about i mean i'm not a i'm not a writer but that that is i mean i think that's why it's so fun to read because it, it could just be chaos because you're talking about anthropology at one part and then like the the musculoskeletal, skeletal, uh, you know, structure of the foot another time, but it, it's all just so, it's so interesting and it all keeps the narrative going so well. And I think one of the reasons that it's, it was important to me to read it now is my oldest daughter is out of school for the summer and we're having, you know, her, mm-hmm. basically her childcare 
is she, she's going to all these camps, different types of camps during the summer. And generally our, our whole life is within like a two mile radius and like her kindergarten, we can walk their kindergarten, the little coffee shop nice. where I go, we can walk to my office is only a mile away if I'm going to the office or I'm generally in my shed. Um, and so we've got this world that's pretty tight in a, a, a town of 500,000 people, but we're in this almost like a small town within that. But because of these camps, we're driving everywhere, like all over the the sprawl of Colorado Springs. And I can tell a difference like in my mood and my overall just irritability of <laughs> starting the day driving for 30 minutes through all this traffic on the interstate and all through all these endless suburbs to get these girls to camp. And so I've always known that the walkability is important for a lot of reasons, but I, I it's, it's become a lot more clear. Can you... Can you talk about walking as it relates to mental health and just how as walking has decreased, maybe mental health issues have have increased? Well, that would be that last would be speculative because I don't I haven't. Um, That's me seen, saying that. Not seen you. Yeah. any research yeah. on that. I certainly would like to believe it. Although I do as much as I advocate for walkable communities and things, I, I do remember that it, we lived in walkable communities for most of human history, including deep history, and didn't necessarily, you know, disallow genocide and hatred and tribalism and all those things. So we have to have to temper it a little bit. But um, there has been a lot of research on walking and mental health. And sometimes it's hard to uh, separate the factors out. I forget what they call it, you, you know, just having the the different variables sure, sure. That, that people are working with. But like there was a huge study in Australia. I don't remember. It was thousands of women, women about my age, like middle aged women. And just looking at how walking 30 minutes a day, five days a week affected their levels of depression and anxiety. And and it's a noticeable decrease. There wow. was a study in I want to say the Los Angeles, Angeles area. And it was about, well, it was actually about access to green spaces, which I, I do wrap into walkability because I feel like if you have to drive to a green space, then you don't necessarily have access to it. Yep. And just the difference, uh, the decrease in uh, aggression mm -hmm. among teens if they have more access to green spaces. There's a lot, quite a bit of research on the decreased risk of dementia and Alzheimer's, again, 30 minutes a day, five days a week of walking. And then from the reverse side, <clears throat> something that I kept trying to look into more, but I think the research is, is just pretty new. So there isn't a lot on it, but just things like with Parkinson's disease, one of the first things that's noticed is the, is the gait, the way people walk. Mm. They aren't able to walk as steadily. And that's a sign that something's going on in the brain. And so it's one of those things that shows you those things are, are deeply connected, even if we don't know how yet. And certainly for myself, like when I feel like I've got depression coming on, I, I describe, I've described this before, but I, I feel like it's like a gel, like it kind of seeps through and mm -hmm. then it, it gels. Like what's that stuff our kids play with? Not not silly putty, but the kind of slime, the yeah, slime that they yeah. make in preschool and kindergarten, like that. And walking doesn't make depression go away, but it keeps the gel from solidifying. So if I can notice that feeling coming on and I make myself go outside for a walk, even if I really, really, really don't want to, mm -hmm. it will help. And I did a, I hosted a panel for the outdoor recreation lab in Montana last fall, which I, it used to be run by the Montana Department of Outdoor Recreation, which you've had Rachel. Vandenberg, yeah, and um, I think we were both, now, you and I both did Rachel. did separate sessions for their summit last oh, year. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I did one with Mike Foote. But this was, so this was one I, I, I um, mo moderated. That's the word, not hosted. And there's a woman who lives locally and works at the community college, and she works in environmental psychology. And she is deep into this, like access to nature and access to walkability and how that relates to your mental health. And she said things like she's got people who are so depressed, you know, clients who are so depressed that they they can't go for a walk. But if they can open a door and step outside of it and have some nature and open space, then it helps mm -hmm. a lot. 
And I think I think that research is just going to grow. There's just it's so clear that it plays a big role. Like there was a huge study in Denmark, like 20, 30,000 kids and how their their executive function, uh, which is how you make decisions and their concentration uh, increased if they walked or biked to school. And it had a greater impact on that than diet did. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, this stuff is, it's everywhere. Like the Scotland, their Department of Health, Ministry of Health, whatever it's called, uh, they have involved the forestry people in their mental health treatments, just having access to walking in forests for people dealing with mental health issues. It's it's just huge. And I think it will get bigger. No, as time goes. That makes sense. And if you just, just very simply, uh, I have to think about things in very simple terms, but you think about <laughs> the, the history of human beings on earth and what percentage that we've been living in these houses. And it's not much at all. Like, I mean, it, it is, we're definitely not living in the habitat that we were designed to live in. And so maybe that's good, maybe that's bad, but it, it is definitely different than what we were designed to do. And so that's, I mean, I do all this crazy stuff, you know, whether it's the cold showers or running for way too long or whatever, but <laughs> to try to like shake myself out of, uh, out of being too civilized. Cause I don't, I don't think it's, it's not good for me. I know that, like, I don't yeah. know for anybody else, but I know very clearly for my brain and the weird way I am that, that sitting around inside is not, that, that's not good. It's not good for me. It's not good for my family because <laughs> they have no, to deal with me. I, same. I mean, even for when my kids were really little and I was home with them and there would be a temper tantrum or just, just tension or screaming or whatever, because little children are insane. That's what they do. <laughs> that's what they do. And they drive you insane. And if I just stepped outside with them, it was like all those emotions just unraveled. And, and I still describe that to them. Now, if if there's a situation going on, if they're arguing or one of them is arguing with me or something, like just step outside and like, man, 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 I don't want to. And just step outside. I don't care. Just do. Mm -hmm. No, no. You just got to step outside. And it's sometimes I have to kick them back out to make sure they stay outside for a few minutes. But it's it's pretty quick. Oh, that yeah. It just allows that space. And so you wonder, well, if we evolved being in the natural world, in the space around us, maybe our mental health evolved in that way. Too. And that's just more, you know, not that it's a cure all, but just beneficial to helping us keep balanced. I mean, the civilized thing, it's so hard because it's not like we're going to, it's not like we're going to derail that train. And oh, yeah. And I like having a lifespan of about, you know, 75, 80 years versus I would have been dead for, <laughs> I would have already been dead for about eight years if I lived back in the old days. Right. What that I'm talking I about. So, dead, like, yeah. I would have died in childbirth. So, oh, yeah. Then, yeah, yeah. Like I mean, it's even um, 25, 30 years ago. But I, I listen to a lot of um, future or read a lot of future stuff just because. So one of the things I, I talk about a lot is I feel like where we are with digital technology, it's really important to look what happened with cars and highways, because that was a technology that certainly conserve humans in some ways, but the ways in which it was implemented and the people it benefited have had a massive detrimental effect on society and human health in so many ways. If, if you just, once you start looking around at how much space parking takes up, mm -hmm. not, not even streets, but just parking, it is, it's insane. Like, why would we give all this space to just storing cars for like 30 minutes? Yep. Which is which is usually what it is. It's like the school drop off thing. People are always complaining about the line, and I'm like, so you think that the taxpayer should pay to have more parking spaces that are used for about a twenty to thirty minute period, twice a day, five days a week, nine months of the year? Yeah. But, You're like, <laughs> yes, you that is. That's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because I want to be able to take my car places. So, I, I mean, this, there's this guy Peter Norton, who's a, a history of technology guy at. Virginia Tech. Uh, I don't want to miss. I think I think it is, but I'd have to check again. And he wrote a book about the, that whole period of time, like the early 1900s, 1920s, 1930s, mm -hmm. when cars initially were not allowed to dominate the streetscape. It was still everybody's space. Mm -hmm. There's this great video online 
Um, I'll send you a link to it, but it's uh, San Francisco 1906. And it's just someone, I think someone mounted a camera in front of a tram. I've seen that. I've seen that before. Yeah. That one. Yeah. It's so cool because it's not just that you're on the tram going through San Francisco, but look at the streetscape. Look at what people are doing. They are all over the place. Mm -hmm. Bicycles, kids, people walking, and they're not looking both directions to Mm -hmm. make sure it's safe to cross because they have a right to be there. So he tracks just this resistance to having cars take over and they almost won. But the, the, you know, the industrial interest behind having cars dominate and having streets dedicated to keeping traffic flowing were so powerful and kind of made their way into government. And that's how you ended up with the, with the highway Mm -hmm. plan, you know, the cross country highway plan, which is fun and I enjoy it, but it was also super destructive to communities all over the country. And so when I look at digital technology, I think of it as like 1919 cars. Mm -hmm. If we don't as a society, if we aren't allowed as a society to help determine how digital technology is used and implemented and affects us, then what kinds of detrimental effects will people face a hundred years from now? We, We can't even predict it. I mean, they couldn't have predicted it with cars a hundred years ago. I mean, climate change. Yeah. There's a good book I just read by a guy named Cal Newport. He wrote a book called Deep Work a long time ago. That was very important to me. Yeah. But he he just wrote one uh, that just came out called A World Without Email. And it's it's not one of these like hack, you know, life hack books where, hey, you don't have to do email and do these five tricks and you'll never. It's not like that. It's more just an examination of how email came to take over and ways that we could avoid letting that become the standard way of communication. And some of it's kind of pie in the sky type stuff, but it's cool to, cause he's a computer scientist. Like he's, he loves technology, right. but it's just about, all right, we've got this powerful tool. Let's figure out a way to use it mindfully and not just, you know, use it for everything. And um, it's, I think some of the reviews I saw, I think people wanted the five steps to no do more do no more email and he's um it's more of like theory about things so people if people are interested that'd be a good one to read um yeah, I should probably read that because I I do I do respond to pretty much every email but as people who correspond with me can attest to sometimes it can take me months that's how I am it just it just sits there and it haunts me and makes me feel guilty me too. and want to eat ice cream and potato chips <laughs> and just I go, it makes me crazy. I, I got so far behind last December, I I did something where every hour on the hour, I ran a mile and a half. And then between the mile and a half loops, I responded to emails and I did it for 24 hours. <laughs> I ran, I ran a 50 K and responded to all the emails. So that problem solved, at least for that day. Yeah. Now it's back. <laughs> at least for that day. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, impressive. I never well, tried that strategy. No, I wouldn't recommend I it. Run, I, I don't like running. I'm yeah, sorry. I, I wouldn't <laughs> recommend it. Running around the neighborhood at night. It was during the quarantine, though, so like there weren't any drunk people out. All the bars were shut, right. shut down, so it was pretty good. <laughs> and it was like 10 degrees. Um, so a few uh, quick questions for you. I, I'm very interested to hear you answer this. What are your favorite books about the West, the history of the West? Could be novels, could be nonfiction could be poetry, but when you think about books about the West, what are your favorite? Uh, you're asking for multiple books. That's a, uh, that however many you me want some flexibility. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, so I know that a lot of people love beyond the hundredth meridian about John Wesley Powell. And there's a book that if you like that one, I think, I think anybody would like Melissa seventies book, mythical river. Hmm. Um, she, it, it's with, I think it's with the university of Iowa press. So it didn't have a big print run. So a lot of people might not have heard of it, but she takes that, that time period. And instead of it being personality driven or like these people are going and trekking off, trying to map somewhere, she, she really looks at the, the spirit of, um, commodification that drove how we view water in the West. Oh, so wow. she talks a lot about like beaver, beaver harvest, you know, and there were so many beavers and it just seemed endless. And then suddenly there wasn't because so many trappers had just used them up for the fur trade. Yeah. And uh, it's it's an incredible book because it goes back through that history. And then she's uh, I think she's from Tucson. She lives in Arizona. She's originally from there. And it goes to the present and, and just things about how our attitude towards water in the West 
initially and all the other resources really dictated things like, is it, is it still true in Colorado? You can't collect rainwater. They, I think they recently changed that, that, but there's still a lot of regulations around it. I mean, it's it's heavily regulated where every drop is, is allocated. And the thing about Melissa too, is she's a, she's a science writer and she does incredible research. She's really clean in her writing and accessible, but she's also a poet. Oh, cool. And word choice is beautiful. So it's just, it's just one of those books that just for me is, it's such a pleasure and so satisfying because I am not a poet at all. And when I read one of those books, like Jane Brox, who wrote Brilliant, The History of Artificial Light, she's also a poet. Mm-hmm. And you can just slow down and appreciate uh, the skill of a writer who doesn't get lost in the beauty of the language, but sure. knows how to choose words with precision. And it, it's just really good. And Melissa is actually a cool writer to watch because she recently signed a book contract um, based on a, it's an essay, a long form essay that she wrote for The Atavist. I don't, I don't know if you ever read that. No, I don't. It's kind of a literary nonfiction site. Um, anyway, so she wrote this long essay about two female scientists who ran the uh, Colorado River through the Grand Canyon in 1938. Oh, cool. And it's, it's a great, great essay. And she just recently signed a book contract that she's going to write about about them. Nice. So. That she sounds like be. she could be a good uh, guest on the podcast. I, I think she could be. She's just super smart and and not um, definitely not equal to skull. <laughs> nice, nice. And she's a wonderful writer. She wrote this piece about earthworms a while back for some little local magazine that I just love. And really? it's not online anymore. Yeah, it's short, but it was just so packed with information and beautifully written. And uh, she kind of reminds me of, um, is it Catherine Schultz who writes those great New Yorker pieces? Mm-hmm where you just follow her through and she gets to the end and you're like, Oh my gosh, you blew my mind. Like the one about stink bugs. I don't know. Oh yeah. Yeah. I I remember that one. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. (laughs) That's cool. That good. Um, and then, so for fiction, I, Willa Cather has been my favorite for a very long time. Like most of my adult life. I, I just think the way she writes about the Western landscape is almost unparalleled. Mm -hmm. Um, but I mean, she really wrote about the frontier, so you have to expand your idea of the West. She did write about the Southwest, but also about Nebraska, which is where she's from. Yeah. Um, but recently, did you ever read Joe Wilkins's Fall Back Down When I Die? He just sent it um, to me the other day, and I, I, oh. I was not, yeah, and he, he, he wrote a nice note in the, in the front of it, and uh, it's on my table, and it's sort of like right next to my bed, and so I'm taking it to the beach with me next week, actually. that's uh, He sounds like a cool guy. Like, people keep telling me I need to know him. Yeah. Yeah, I I um I think he had a piece in that Montana Land Reliance anthology. Oh, did I? yeah, I know he did. It was it was really good. And when I read that novel, I was like, okay, here is finally a book, a novel that I feel like understands the the tensions of the modern West. Mm-hmm. And and when I think about the West, I really in my head it's always the mythical West or the yeah. imagined West yeah. because we fix it in our heads as something that has only existed since colonization sure. and, and colonialism. So, so to me, it's, it's not necessarily about this place, but it's about the time period that has spanned this landscape mm-hmm. for a short amount, you know, a short amount of centuries. Anyway, that book, it's, it's tight. It's very spare. Um, it's kind of sad, but also hopeful. And I just feel like he really got at anything like the sagebrush rebellion and yeah. the Bundy resistance and all the anti-public land stuff. It, it's not like he addressed those things directly, but I feel like he really nailed the personalities and sentiments that drive those things. I'm like, excited to read it. I, I thought it was really good. Yeah, I'd, I'd be interested to know what you, what people you keep, you know, people bring him up constantly. Um, I just, I wish I had more time to just devote to, Cause I've got this long, every time I talk to like anybody like you or anybody else, it's just, I've, it's more and more interesting people and more and more interesting books I need to read and time is everything. <laughs> but he, um, his name has come up. Yeah. His name, it continues to come up as just as obviously a talented artist, but, a a, um, just a, a nice, good guy on top of that. So I'm excited to, mm-hmm. to read it. Uh, yeah. I, Alexis Bonagoski, I said, I think mm-hmm. they went to school together. Oh, okay. Possibly. Yeah, that makes sense. And she's great. So I'm like, if she thinks someone's nice, then I'd... she's awesome. I, she I love is. Her. She's how I found your podcast. Right? Oh, really? On Instagram. I think she posted her interview with you, and, and she's that's, awesome. She's that a. Was I have first introduction. Yeah, yeah, so much admiration for. I don't understand how she does everything she does. You know what I'd really love though? I would love to 
have books or stories about this beyond the 100th Meridian landscape from before colonialism. And mm-hmm. I don't mean like sacred stories. Um, I don't want to don't want to invade those or, you know, and touch those. But I just I feel I feel deeply rooted to Montana. You know, I'm a fifth generation Montana. And this is the place I love. It's the place I'm devoted to. I, I do more activism than I should because I don't have time for it. But just wanting to protect and uh, honor the, this place that I've grown up in and has given me so much. But in order to feel fully connected, I feel like I should know more about mm-hmm. the pre-colonial history, like the pre-homesteader history, yeah. just of the landscape and the people who lived here. And there there are books like, you know, Plenty Coup, Chief of the, the Crows, which is interesting to read. But it's just, it's all from almost all written by white people. And mm-hmm. I'm just like, I don't know what those stories would look like, but I would, I would certainly read them. I would love to read them. Same. I'd love to read them. That, totally. That's a great idea. Flip it all inside out and on its head and, and take me there. If you want. <laughs> um, I would love that. So kind of final question. Um, if you could offer some words of wisdom and you got a lot of wisdom in there, um, words of wisdom <laughs> to the people that listen to this podcast and, and, I appreciate you listening for as long as you have. So, I mean, you, you kind of get I what I'm it. trying to do here, but like what, what would you kind of final words of wisdom or request anything like that of the people that listen? Oh, I, I actually wrote down a bunch of things in preparation for that, but I don't want to just spiel them off. I'll just throw out a couple of writing specific ones and then like the more personally being a human. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, so one of my, one of my mentors is, um, Alan Weissman who wrote the world without us. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've ever read that. That's it. I've not read great. it. I know who he is though. Yeah. Yeah. He's a, uh, he's just a, he's a great writer. It's amazing how he can do so much research and you're just, it's a page turner and so interesting. And when I signed my book contract for the walking book, we talked for like an hour and a half on the phone. And one of the things he said to me was, Take your the main assumption about your subject and push at it as hard as you can from every angle you can think mm. of. And and just for me, I I often say that a lot of my I, essays I kind of write like debates because I was a high school debater, okay. and so I write them like a debate case. So that's yeah. part of why I'm always taking things from from every side. And so that was really helpful for me. Just keep pushing. So like my core assumption was walking makes us human, um, and that's you know, part of why they have so much about disability in there, because I, I think it's important if we make that claim to really, really talk about what that means. Sure. Um, and then H. Emerson Blake, Chip Blake, from who used to be executive editor at Orion magazine, mm-hmm. he just like in passing, it wasn't even to me, it was just like at lunch one day at some conference, he was like, be a good host to your reader. And I was like, oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> why did I do an MFA? That was it. That's all that <laughs> <matters>. <laughs> But but for the rest of it, you know, I thought about this a lot because I do write so much about community and the importance of it. And and I also feel like with the climate change just here and more of it coming down the pipeline, I've said like for years, ever before I published anything major, just you have to find a community and really dig into it yep. hard and, and commit to it and help it. And I'm lucky to live where I do. I chose moving back to Whitefish because it's my kind of my secondary hometown. It's the place I went to high school. And I'm lucky that it has a long tradition of that. It's very forward thinking with its planning. It really thinks about what do we want, you know, our town's going to grow. What do we want it to look like in 30 years? Okay, we have to make decisions that help it grow well, you know, and, and it's actually kind of hard to find that. But I'm fortunate in in having that. And so I think, I heard this interview with this guy, Jeremy Lent, and I don't know how to describe him. Philosopher, maybe? Uh I'm not sure. But he was on Douglas Rushkoff's Team Human podcast. And he talked about um, connective tissue. And he he talked, he's more talking societal connective tissue between people. But he also talked about how biologists are starting to come out with with research that's really looking at the connective tissue in the body as its own organ. Mm. Like the skin's its own organ, which was really interesting. But I realized when I heard that, that I would go with all these podcasts and all the things I read, that is what I'm always looking for. I am looking for the societal, um, interpersonal, connective tissue. Mm -hmm. And I think my advice for people would be, what the heck do we do with our 
with our lives and how do we help our communities is look for the people who are already building that connective tissue or repairing it. Because I can pretty much guarantee you there's almost always someone. Oh, yeah. Anywhere. I mean, when I was doing the walking research and I would go to these conferences, there'd be like tiny communities in Western North Dakota that are working on walkability, mm-hmm. um, you know, for their two street town or whatever. There and there are people, you know, like backcountry hunters and anglers. I'm a I'm a member and I'm a big supporter of their work. Sometimes they're the reason I get up in the morning. Yeah, <laughs> they, they do so much good. Um, you know, public lands advocacy, or I heard a great interview with a guy who started this thing with the Lake Erie watershed of thinking about it yourself as a citizen of a watershed mm-hmm. instead of a citizen of a, a um, town or a yeah, nation. Yeah, yeah. And I just love that way of thinking. If you can think of yourself as a citizen of a watershed, then you start looking at what can I do to help keep that watershed really healthy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that's a fascinating way to approach life. I agree, <laughs> especially in the uh, West. Yeah, and, and just, I think I think a lot of your listeners probably do this already, maybe not intentionally, but I bet they do, which is complicate people's assumptions about yourself. Mm-hmm. Because it's so easy to believe the narratives that we're told about, you know, for example, liberal or conservative. I don't want to, you know, go into that whole realm, but I, I think we we look at those mass narratives of identities and, and think that we have to be in one because we're told that everybody's in one. Yeah. And then we feel weird if we're like, but wait, I think kind of differently about this subject than a lot of my more liberal or conservative friends. Mm-hmm. And I think if you can complicate people's assumptions about you and you complicate your assumptions about them, then you find a lot of conversations open up and a lot of what you can do opens up. I, I think if you're going to get interested in some kind of activism, for example, or, you know, running for city council or county commissioner, more good people should run for county commissioner that I would, I would love to, Mm -hmm. to see that. Um, And if you're a multimillionaire, uh, take your state and fund local journalism for 10 years all over the place. (laughs) <laughs> I would, I just like just somebody please just do it because we really, really need it. I don't know if any of that is really good advice. I think it's all good advice. I I'm, have a reverent advice like life is too short to wear boring socks. But. I like that too. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I don't know. I think we're, we're, um, I don't, sometimes I feel like we might be in a paradigm shift of some kind, sometimes not, but I feel like. I would like a different paradigm. And so I want to do things that help build it. Mm-hmm. Well, that's helping. obvious. I mean, that's, that's clear through your work. I mean, that's why I wanted to have you on here. Cause I just, seriously, I, I admire, I admire everything you do. I think it's um, in this world where everything seems to be getting boiled down to whatever, however many characters they allow on Twitter, like yours brings nuance and brings like an evolution of thought and, and it's just, it's open and it's welcoming, but it's, you've got, you got opinions about things. Um, and I think it's, <laughs> I think it's awesome. I mean, I think that's what we need more of. And so I, I just appreciate you. I know it's hard work and I know it, this stuff doesn't write itself and you, you work very, very, I can only imagine how hard you work at this, um, to put it out there. So anyway, I'm just glad to know you. I appreciate Thanks. you coming on here and, chatting with me and I'll look forward to more conversations that we don't record. Uh, I feel the same way. I feel the same way. This is really, I, I appreciate your podcast for the same reason for, for what it provides and the way my mind can roam about among different ways of being in the world. And it's really cool. I have strong opinions about napweed. Right now, just, <laughs> we do just, a separate podcast about just about you know, napweed. We could really because there was one you did one uh, it was someone in Texas I can't remember wildlife biologist maybe and at the very end of it it wasn't even part of your interview you just said to him yeah we need to talk more because something something about drought and dried up abandoned ranches and oh yeah 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 of, of Dave Hewitt uh, weeds Dave Hewitt and, yeah yeah and I was like that is the most hopeful, hopeless thing I've ever heard <laughs> because it's something you can do something about. Yeah. And I, I hope someday we actually figure it out, but that's okay. the key is doing, sure. you got to be doing like, that's what I think. I mean, I don't like, I like talking, but then I like solutions. I like going and, and I don't yeah. like sitting around. So yeah, I, think, I, I can't listen to complaining for me more than a minute. But. <laughs> All right. You're awesome. I really appreciate this. Right. Thank you so you much. You are awesome. Thank you. <laughs> 
Today is Ed again. Thanks so much for listening to the podcast. I know your time is valuable, so it means the world that you spend it listening. If you want to support the podcast and help it to continue to spread and grow, there are a few ways you can help. Number one, pass it along to a friend or share it on social media. Word of mouth recommendations are the most powerful way for ideas to spread, so I'd love it if you could share the podcast with a few pals who might enjoy it. Number two, you can go to Apple Podcasts and give it a five-star review. Good reviews encourage the Apple overlords to suggest the podcast to others. So there's a link in the notes if you'd be so kind as to give it five stars. Number three, you can support the podcast financially via Patreon. And there are exclusive benefits for those who do, including a monthly behind-the-scenes newsletter, Mountain and Prey stickers, live and recorded video chats with podcast guests, and much more. Number four. I've also got two emails that I send out. The first is my weekly email called Good News from the American West, which I send out every Wednesday. It's only positive news, something we can all use a little more of these days. And my other email is my bi-monthly book recommendations email. One email every other month with five, six, seven, or eight books that I've recently read and highly recommend. The thousands of people on both of these lists will vouch for me. No spam or other funny business. And number five, finally... Check out my online store for Mountain and Prairie stickers, shirts, and coffee mugs. I've got some really cool designs from Western artists with more on the way. So head to mountainandprairie.com slash shop to check it all out. I'd love to connect with you. I'm on Instagram and LinkedIn. So look me up on either of those platforms by my name or through the links on my website. All right, that's it. Thanks so much for your support. 